The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is, uh, as you can see from the title slide, how I learned to really love software foundations. Um, this is me. Uh, some people may remember me from such projects as Tech Journalism and the OpenSUSE Project Manager, or Community Manager. Um, these days, I work for Citrix full time. Uh, right now, I'm working on the CloudStack project. I'm actually a PMC member on CloudStack, um, recovering tech journalist. Uh, if you have any comments or thoughts about my talk, uh, please uh, feel free to tweet me. Uh, I love when people uh, do the social media thing. Uh, if you have any questions or comments after the talk, that's my email address. Uh, I usually get snarky with people who ask for my email address because that indicates you probably don't know how to use Google. But um, just jzb at zonker.net will get to me or jzb at apache.org. So as I mentioned, uh, I used to work on this project, OpenSUSE. How many people have used OpenSUSE? Okay. Um, really good group of people uh, that, that, you know, kind of originated the SUSE distribution. Uh, really fun project to work on. A lot of people that I really like. Um, but I was paid full time to work for these folks. Uh, now, Novell, there are also a lot of bright, nice people that were at Novell when I was there. Uh, as you all know, Novell really doesn't exist anymore. They were sold and split up and everything. But uh, I worked there from 2008 to 2010. And they hired me because they wanted to make OpenSUSE a successful open source project, OK? Um, the problem being, corporations and open source don't always mix very well, right? Um, you, you spend a lot of time explaining what you should do and then people spend a lot of time explaining to you why that's not going to happen or why it conflicts with their business interest and things like that. Uh, how many people remember iFolder? Only one, two people. iFolder was sort of like pre-Dropbox, okay? And it had, uh, I think it was under like 2003, 2004, the guys that had come in from Zimian when Novell bought them uh, were like, let's make this open source. Let's, let's build a community. Let's you know, do this, that. And there was a lot of enthusiasm and people were excited. And then it got moved to a different business unit and it just died. And they stopped updating it. And you went to them and said, you really, I spent nine months lobbying to get them to do the right thing, to at least communicate to the outside world this project no longer exists as an open source project and they wouldn't it took nine months to get any movement at all uh, so i learned a lot of frustration about corporate open source okay um, so what i'm going to talk about today is open source software foundations now there are many different open source software foundations and i'm going to make the case why you might consider working within one of these if you're not already or why you might want to check out projects that are in one of these foundations. Now, these are not all alike. My experience has largely been with Apache, okay? Uh, so what I say today is largely applicable to Apache, but it also applies to Eclipse and some other ones. Um, not every project belongs in a foundation. If you're working on a small project, uh, if you're working on something that it scratches a very personal itch, uh, it may be fine on GitHub, okay? Uh, but if you're talking about large projects that involve 10, 20, 30 developers or more uh, that has a corporate use, you may want to explore a software foundation. How many people are working on something like that today? One person? Nobody else? Two? Uh, how many people are using software from one of these groups? Okay. Uh, how many people are in a position to contribute? A couple more? All right. Uh, well, hopefully, at the end of this presentation, you'll be at least inspired to contribute, if not uh, start a project. So uh, the impetus for this talk came from, how many people remember Apache considered harmful about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years? So basically, somebody who had been involved with an Apache software project 
got very frustrated because they were trying to adopt Git and some things that Apache wasn't initially set up for. And they basically made the case that, you know, there's GitHub. What do you need, why do you need more than GitHub? You can move fast on GitHub. You can do great development there, right? Um, and I think there is a strong case for open source foundations for a number of reasons far beyond just the tools, okay? Reason number one, a lot of companies find open source very scary. This is not, in fact, a screenshot from The Exorcist. This is the GPL as described by a corporate lawyer, okay? Um, a lot of companies are very scared of open source. They're a lot less so now, uh, but they, they need some hand-holding. They need, they need some help, okay? Uh, now, I'm not necessarily talking about every corporation. There are certain corporations that get it. Uh, obviously, Red Hat, uh, you know, kind of gets the open source thing. Um, there are other companies that get it, but it's not in their DNA in most cases. So for a corporation or a large organization to get involved with open source, they need a little help. And like I said, when I was at Novell, uh, I experienced a great deal of frustration because you spend a lot of time telling them what they should do. Uh, what really you kind of need is a, is a trainer, okay? You don't need to just get the book and know what you should do. You need somebody telling you, you must do that, okay? Uh, how many people have just gone out and spontaneously lost a bunch of weight? Spontaneously? <laughs> um, so, I mean, I've, I've had the fortune to work with a personal trainer. Obviously not recently, okay? Um, but it was very helpful having somebody, you know, kind of guiding you through the process, telling you what you should do, getting you on a plan, and you know, you know why personal trainers make you pay up front? So that you actually show up the first, after the first time. Um, so, Another thing that I really like about Apache is there are rules, okay? <laughs> there are actually codified practices for working within an Apache project that you don't get when you're working in a corporation or, or a, a open source project that's freelance, okay? Again, there's a lot of, well, we should do this, or it's a good practice. Uh, the Red Hat Fedora folks, have, what's the guide that you guys have, Paul? I forget, it's the... Uh, open source, basically like a, a manual for open source, Karsten oh, working. The open source way. The open source way, thank you. Um, so there is the open source way. Apache actually has a site on the Apache way, okay? The difference uh, between saying, going to your manager and saying, you should read the open source way, and being involved in Apache is you basically get to tell your manager, no, we have to do this. Not we should, we must. Another thing I like about Apache is you have an incubation period for projects. Okay, they actually have a planned life cycle for projects, and part of that is taking in a project and putting you through the paces uh, to become a healthy community, not just code-wise, but actually community-wise. And part of that is mentoring, okay? So you actually have people who are going to help you uh, work through this process that have been through it before. It's not like everybody, uh, I'll, I'll use CloudStack as an example, okay? When CloudStack was proposed to the incubator last year, the number of people in Citrix who had actually worked in a successful open source project was a very small number. But there were a lot of developers involved and they needed a little assistance in uh, becoming acclimated to doing things the open source way. Another thing that I really like about Apache is the philosophy of community over code, okay? This is really, really important. You get a lot of developers who are not uh, used to open source and they are more concerned about getting features in and being productive and efficient than actually fostering a community. That means they're more interested in pushing their stuff in and getting it merged than mentoring new developers or answering people's questions or responding to people's queries about, uh, you know, if you, if you completely redo this, if you guys come in and refactor this area of the code, how is that gonna impact what I wanna do in two months, okay? And without some sort of framework, uh, when a company is left to its own devices to push forward on an open source project, uh, it often does not pay attention to community development the way that it should. Um, another thing that I like about foundations is they supply infrastructure, okay? GitHub is a great tool for collaborative software development. Uh, but it is missing some pieces, okay? How many people have gone to look for a project that has a GitHub page and the only information is a, is a readme? 
okay? Uh, no documentation, just the README. If you're, if you, you don't even necessarily have a license. How many people have gone and looked at, at a GitHub project and found there's not even a default license here, okay? Uh, when you're working in with, within a foundation, they are going to pretty much suggest a license for you. You're gonna know what you're getting into. Um, another thing that you get, uh, you don't just go into a pro something like Apache and basically, you know, get a month of mentoring and then kind of toddle your own way. You also get mentoring and reporting, okay? That means that you're actually accountable to someone. Uh, incubating projects actually have to produce a report, and uh, so do graduated projects. So they are always accountable to someone in a way that other open source projects are not. Another thing that's really important about foundations is membership. Uh, how many people have heard or have experienced, well, let's, let's take a step back. How many folks actually use Linux on a regular basis? Okay. How many of you are familiar with the X window system? Okay. How many of you are still using X386? Exactly. Okay, I don't know how many folks remember the reason why we're all using x.org today, uh, but it had a lot to do with the fact that developers who wanted to get code and wanted to see more transparent processes got very frustrated with the people who were leading the project. Okay, um, in Apache and other foundations, there are guidelines for people getting commit access, which prevents there from being, at least one hopes, a core team of developers who don't let anyone else in. Uh, this is one of the things that we've been very conscious of with CloudStack, is watching people's contributions and after they've made a number of successful good contributions saying, you know what, these people need to have the commit bit so that A, they can be a little more efficient, they don't have to be reviewed every time they want to put something into the code base, and B, so they feel acknowledged and welcome in the community, that they know that they are part of this and they have a stake. Another really important thing about Apache is that I contribute as myself. I don't contribute as an employee of Citrix. I don't contribute uh, wearing a corporate hat at all. I contribute as an individual, okay? Uh, and this is very, very important because it means that you are supposed to be doing the best thing for the project, not necessarily for your corporate sponsor. Um, I find this extremely important. I've been kind of going on for a few minutes and everybody's been very quiet. So are there any questions or thoughts so far? Okay. One yeah. Comment a question. Um, when you get into the, the accountability, what are the things that you're being accountable for? Uh, so like when we do reporting in Apache, you're supposed to talk about the community diversity, uh, any issues that you might have encountered, uh, what progress you have made since the, I'm sorry, uh, I'll repeat the question. Uh, so the question was, uh, what do I mean when I talk about accountability, right? Yes. Okay, so um, what they want when they look for reporting is first, they want to know if there are any problems. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll use CloudStack as an example again. We had a period of time where we found uh, we were having a little bit of a problem with some of the contributions not going through the proper process. So they actually had to be pulled out and go through a separate legal review, IP review, okay, which was a problem that we needed to correct. Um, but they're looking for things like, is everybody doing development in the open? Are you doing uh, stuff on the mailing list? Uh, have you gotten any new contributors or new PMC members since last month and things like that? So that's kind of what they're really looking for. And they, want, they basically want to make sure that you're still alive, right? Not every project, CloudStack has been very, very active, um, objectively speaking. There are other incubating projects that only have a couple of people who are doing development and they want to know, is this project ever going to successfully graduate or is this project just going to kind of languish in the incubator? Because at a certain point you need to say, either it's going to graduate or it needs to be, you know, put in the, the attic, okay? Um, another thing that uh, Apache is uh, really good for and other foundations are good for is legal rules and guidance, okay? Um, one of the first things that happened when the code was donated to Apache last year was we went through file by file to make sure that everything was actually distributable uh, under Apache rules, okay? And Apache has specific rules about what things you can distribute. Not everything in our code, be code base, code beast, 
uh, code base must be Apache licensed, but it must be compatible with the Apache license. So MIT and BSD are okay, GPL is not, all right? Um, proprietary, obviously, is not, and we had to rejigger some things so that we could distribute there. But there are things, uh, also trademark guidelines and whatnot, so that you actually enforce your trademark and they make sure that your trademark, you're not stepping on somebody else before you graduate. They do some due diligence there, okay? One of my favorite rules is this. If it didn't happen on the mailing list, it didn't happen. Anybody know why that's really important? Documentation. Who said documentation? Okay, that is one good rule, but it's not the most important. Deb? So Deb says, uh, so you don't replicate. Um, that's not quite what I'm looking for. Yeah. Accountability. Accountability is important. Transparency. Transparency. And to make sure that everybody has a say in the community, has an opportunity to have a say, I should say. Um, there are projects that have their meetings and make decisions on IRC, for example. There is a problem there. We have contributors in Europe. We have contributors on both coasts of the United States. We have contributors in the middle of the United States. Uh, we have folks in India and I think a couple, one or two people in Australia. Getting all of those folks in a conversation in real time is really, really hard, okay? And that means inevitably, if we do things in real time, if we do them on IRC or chat or something like that, people get left out. If five guys get together at a conference and have a hack fest and decide we're going to refactor storage, somebody's gonna get left out, okay? Uh, so you need to do it on the mailing list and you have a wait period before major decisions are made. And if you can't reach consensus, you have a vote, okay? Another thing that I really like about Apache is they are concerned about the entire life cycle of a project. How many people have gone to look for something, you've heard about a really neat open source project and you go, we haven't had an update since like 1999, 2005, some ridiculous amount of time, right? Um, at a certain point, if an Apache project is not being updated, if it's not being taken care of, they'll put it in the attic, okay? That's just as important to me as the beginning part of the life cycle. So, what's the experience like when you actually go new into Apache? When you're a corporation, you donate something to Apache. Um, it's sort of like the five stages of grief for a lot of folks in the organization. <laughs> First, there's denial, okay? Um, a lot of people just don't realize that their job is in fact gonna change as a developer, that they're actually going to have to do things a different way. And largely they don't. And they get called on it, which again, I think is great because you actually have a structure that allows you to go to your manager or somebody else's manager and say, you can't do that. It's not me, it's Apache, okay? Um, it's really hard to argue that when you're standing alone, all right? Uh, the next stage for a lot of folks is anger. Um, you know, when you tell a developer who's always been able to push things into core that they have to wait 72 hours to make a major merge, you usually find a little bit of anger at that. You usually get a lot of frustration, okay? Um, developers are good at a great many things, but being told no is not always one of them, okay? So after you go through that stage, usually the next thing that you hit is bargaining. Um, well, can we bend this rule for this? Can we do this differently just in this case? And the answer is usually no. No, you cannot. Um, and after you go through that for a while, you get depression. Um, people are a little demoralized for a while. They're a little bummed out that they can't, it, it's not the way things have always been. Uh, luckily, this phase usually doesn't last too terribly long. Um, some people, it lasts longer than others, but for the most part, it's, it's sort of a trough. You get through the other side, and finally, you, you keep working, you work the process, and finally, you get to acceptance, and everyone is happy, okay? Um, now, I don't want to oversell it. I don't want to claim that foundations are the silver bullet or the magic fairy dust that are going to rescue every single open source project that a corporation or a group wants to, uh, you know, make successful. It's not as awesome as a kitten riding a unicorn over a rainbow, um, but it is pretty good. There are problems, and I, I want to be honest about some of the problems. One is infrastructure. 
Now, as I said, Apache provides infrastructure and demands, as a matter of fact, that you have certain infrastructure. On the other hand, Apache, what Apache giveth, it doesn't always giveth quickly. Um, it can take weeks, sometimes months, to get things provisioned, which can be very, very inconvenient. Um, not that that is unique to software foundations. Uh, this happens in corporations as well. Um, you can have uh, the downside to everything must have consensus is reaching consensus occasionally can be a little laborious and certainly more so than when you do it and you can just have a, a BDFL that says it will be this way, right? Um, there are other problems as well. David, anything to add in this uh, particular section? No? Okay. Is that a lack of things to talk about or simply an unwillingness? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have really powered through these a lot faster than I expected. Uh, that is actually what I have got. Uh, so now I will take any questions that you might have. Um, yes, sir. Will be the actual process. Uh, it varies a lot. So, for example, uh, let's take uh, the Linux Foundation and Eclipse. I think Eclipse process is very similar to Apache. So, basically, you go and you say, "We have this project. We have a code base, and we have, you know, this number of people who are ready to form a, 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 a project." Uh, then Linux Foundation is a little more corporate, and it's a little more. You kind of go to their board and you, it's, a li, uh, it's a less transparent process. You would go to their board and you say, you know, we have this saying like the Zen stuff that they wanted to put under Linux Foundation uh, and there's discussions and however they do that. Um, but I don't think that's, it's nowhere near as transparent or uh, as simple as Apache. Uh, then you have like the software uh, Freedom Conservancy uh, run by Bradley Kuhn and some other folks. Uh, their process is a little bit different. I think you go to Bradley and their board and you say, we'd like to get this in. And uh, their main constraint is actually the number of people uh, because they provide different services. They don't, they don't do mentoring the way they do. Um, or they don't do mentoring the way we do, but they do provide legal services and some other, uh, an umbrella 401c and things like that. Uh, so their intake process is different and there is no um, mentoring, there is no incubation period, things like that. Uh, the one regret that I have about uh, software foundations when I was researching this is that there is no, that I know of, there is no Apache-like organization for copyleft projects, okay? So Eclipse and Apache are obviously very corporate-friendly licenses, um, but I don't know of an organization that actually provides mentoring and incubation for a software project that is copyleft friendly, which I think is, is actually a shame because I would like to see more adoption of those licenses. I'm fine with Apache, I have no complaints about that as a license and I know a lot of businesses are much happier with that license, uh, but at the same time, I think there, uh, there's a lot of room for mentoring for GPL projects and stuff that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so the question is, what about the SF FSF? No, I mean, uh, they really don't provide the same kind of services. Um, Deb? Um, they do for the new projects, but you have to convince them that you should be a new project, which is an entirely different process. Um, and until recently, that meant that you were interested in being part of the new Linux operating system. Uh, they've only just in the last two years accepted web-based projects Okay. 
Uh, and the, the other thing I would add to that, everybody laughed when she said, make sure the code compiles. That's not actually trivial. Um, so uh, any other questions or comments? Yes? Uh, so the question is, what happened to projects that don't incubate or don't make it? They don't get through that process. They don't. That don't. Okay. So the question is, what happens to projects that don't graduate? Um, not really aware of many. I think most of the ones that haven't graduated uh, weren't kicked out. They simply just sort of, you know. They just start incubation forever. Well, no. They they actually get retired. But I'm not. Now, David, you may know of one, but I don't know of anybody who's ever been, you know, basically shown the door. Like, I think it's more of a we don't have the momentum to graduate, not you guys just aren't getting your stuff together. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you want to look at any time. Uh yes. It sounds like there's a fairly high bar, first of all, to um uh entry here as far as being organized in a project and having several people involved in it before you take it to like a foundation like Apache. And so um I'm still unclear as to what the vetting process is there and uh, what level you have to be at. And if these projects need to have any relevance to Apache to be accepted, are there any fees involved? Okay, so that was several questions. So I'm going to try to sum that up and then I'll answer your questions. So the question is basically, what are the criteria for a project to get into the incubator and are there any fees involved? Um, those are, so um, there are not, uh, there are some set criteria. The bar is, it's about this high. Uh, I would not say it's like this high. Uh, the bar is definitely there to ensure that they don't waste their time setting up infrastructure for a project that has no hope of graduation. You have, a, you have to have mentors, you have to have a champion, uh, you have to have a proposal. Um, there will be discussion on the incubator mailing list, the general mailing list, that is centered around, okay, what problem do you solve that isn't already being solved by another open source project? Um, do you have the diversity, uh, or do you have a plan to create diversity? So like, uh, when Citrix came to Apache with CloudStack. Obviously, it didn't have a great deal of diversity at the moment, uh, but they, they you know, brought in some people that were customers that wanted to contribute, and they basically showed, we have a plan to create that kind of diversity. Um, and so basically, any project that is accepted into the incubator will be vetted and discussed, and um, you know, that's kind of an opportunity. I've seen one project recently, for example, uh, after about a day's discussion of what makes your project different from this and this and this, uh, and they didn't have satisfactory answers, they basically said, thank you, you've given me stuff to think about, and I'll come back. Um, and so that's a, that's a, that's a good result. Uh, as far as fees, there are no fees. Um, so if you have five, ten people uh, who are completely dirt poor but have an open source project they want to get into Apache, uh, that, is, that should not be a barrier. Okay. Uh, as long as they have computers, uh, that would be good. But no, no fees. Um, For software, computers? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, you know, I've mainly talked about software foundations and things like GitHub, and there are alternatives to those, certainly. Um, and so I'll talk about that for a minute. 
there are a couple of options. One is you don't have a foundation of any sort. You have a group of people who run a project and somebody owns a domain and somebody owns a, maybe owns a trademark or maybe doesn't. Somebody pays a hosting bill, maybe you raise money, maybe you don't. Uh, and that can continue indefinitely and be lovely. Or you can run into problems where somebody decides that domain is suddenly valuable and I'd like to exploit it commercially and guess what, it's in my name. And we have seen that, right? Uh, it's, it's rare, but it does happen. Um, it's sort of like going into business with friends. I don't recommend it unless it's a very, very small project with almost zero commercial interest. The other way is for projects that are big enough or want to be big enough and actually invest the money in creating a foundation specifically for that project. That is an option uh, and sometimes it works out very well, but it is a lot of work to do. Uh, and you also have to reinvent the wheel. Um, you have to basically establish the ground rules for contribution. You have to establish, well, do people pay a fee to come in or do they, do they not? How do we raise money for this to exist? Um, if you have a certain type of project, that may be worth exploring, but I don't recommend it. So, uh, Deb, you had a question. Yeah, so let me, let me re reiterate that for the camera and the folks at home. Hi folks at home, everybody wave at the folks at home. Um, so uh, to reiterate that, there are organizations like uh, the Software Freedom Law Center that will help you with incorporation and things if you go to them and ask nicely and they have the time. And, the, um, and so there are resources and you can certainly um, talk to other people who have done it and they are usually very generous with their advice because they've made the mistakes and they will tell you what they were, probably, um, as long as they actually recognize what those mistakes were. Uh, David. So I'm going to be very generous with advice. <laughs> So for the camera and the folks at home, I'm going to sum that up as it's a bad idea. You're reinventing the wheel. There's no reason to do it. Um, yes. One of the other options I don't know that we talk about much, but there's also the, the forming a services organization around your code as well, which has been done in, in over and over, right? So you've got your, your corporation that sponsors the project. Mm -hmm. What's the 
viability of doing that versus using a foundation. Did you have an example in mind? Uh, Ansible and Ansible Works, Open NMS and the Open NMS project. Okay. Uh, well, those are really just companies, right? They're companies, but they've also got software, open source software, most often uh, involved with them. So, as opposed to a company writing a product that's mm -hmm. proprietary, it's a company writing a product that's open source. Sure. Um, okay. So the question was, or the comment is, basically, there are. Uh, groups that have founded around, companies that have founded around open source projects like Ansible, OpenMS. Uh, I'll give some other examples that should uh, send chills down people's spine. Uh, MySQL, um, you know, uh, you, you basically, so the, the thing is, that's fine for companies. Um, it's not fine for people who want to contribute that are not part of that company. And it's not fine for people who have a vested interest in that existing as an open source project in the future. Um, because basically, if you know that there are a limited number of people, private individuals or a company that have control over that code base, and it's important to your business, and at some point they can be bought, or they can change the terms, or they can you know, do whatever, uh, that's, not, that's, that's not a foundation, pardon the pun, it's not a foundation for a healthy open source project in the long term. Um, I, now, there are people that I thoroughly, thoroughly, 100% trust that do things like that. Uh, Luke with Puppet Labs, totally trust Luke and his intentions, and I would contribute to Puppet in a heartbeat. Um, but Luke is not immortal, as far as I know. Uh, they have accepted venture capital, uh, and Puppet Labs may someday not be Puppet Labs. And the people who are running Puppet currently will not always be the people running Puppet. Uh, and so um, it takes a lot of personal will to run a project for at least for, for, to meet my standards of trust. And even that is a, little, is a little concerning because eventually the people who have earned that trust are no longer going to be there. So. Uh, Yes, sir. One more question, sorry, I'm a lot of questions. Um, but um, can I take a GPL project from the ASF? Um, Launch one or relicense? Yeah, uh, <laughs> so the question is, can you take a GPL project to the ASF? And the, the short and pithy answer to that is yes, as long as it's not going to be GPL uh, when you get done. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, CloudStack was, in fact, GPL v3. And the reason that they switched was two things. One, obviously wanting to go to Apache, and two, feedback from their customers saying, or potential customers saying, we like open source, but uh, see the exorcist pi picture earlier in the uh, presentation when we think about GPL v3. Um, so. so you Uh, so the question was, uh, do you have to track down all the contributors? Um, yes and no, actually. Um, so in our case, it wasn't necessarily about contributors. It was about some of the libraries and things that we were using that we had to replace or figure out a way not to distribute those. Uh, but yes. We did, we did go out and reach out to every contributor who was not employed by Citrix or formerly Cloud.com. Um, and we were able to
guy in Russia. Literally, we sent lawyers, we sent the Russian mafia, we sent uh, we sent people from all over Eastern Europe looking for the skeleton in question. Could not find the guy. Called his employer, called the tax employers. Uh, had people in Russia who were on the Russian equivalent of Facebook looking for him. Never could find the guy. Uh, we ended up having to take all these cases. And so, in further response to the question about finding the people, that is a compelling case to, if you know you want to do something on this level, take it to Apache or another foundation quickly. Don't, you know, try to do it on your own as a company and then after a couple of years decide, well, now we're going to do this. Uh, I think I could be wrong on this. I think companies and startups are thinking more about that today than they did, you know, five, ten years ago. Uh, so I think they're, they're more proactive in that way, but yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks very much for your time, folks. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption, I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then, as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast; uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, 
one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. Add on seeing your limits with the clouds tag. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication from Wicked. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, 
our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.